Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good to be back to um, Springdale, Washington. Deer Park. Deer Park. Sorry. <laughs> you know, as, as we get started this morning, I want to share one Bible passage that um, this last Sunday night, as we were being pelted by Hurricane Irma, with about 90 mile an hour winds and a just pouring down rain, just lashing. If you've ever been through a hurricane, you know what I'm talking about, but it just, it's like it just lashes and beats, just beats uh, at your house or wherever you are. And I was so, so grateful. I was so grateful that I slept well Sunday night. Uh, I, I don't even actually remember the 90 mile an hour winds and the rain. I, I just, I really don't remember. The one thing I do remember was Psalms 139 uh, verses 9 through 11. Now that I remember. Because as I went to sleep Sunday night, those verses, I was thinking about them in my mind. And um, I had perfect peace. Not because I can generate or manufacture that, because none of us can. But the Lord can through His Word. Amen. Psalm 139, I would encourage you to memorize... Uh, verses 1 through 11. That's what I've done so far and of course verse 14 and 23 and 24 but uh, the only three verses I want to look at are these in verses 9 through 11. It says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. I want to focus particularly on verse 10. It says that even there, if we're in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, God will hold our hand. And it says, and thy right hand shall hold me. So folk, God has promised that he will hold us in the palm of his hand. And um, I just kept going over that in my mind and fell asleep with those words in my mind Sunday night as Irma was lashing against our home. God was holding me and my family right there in the palm of his hand. And I just praise the Lord this morning that uh, I can testify to you we had no damage to our home, uh, we had no damage to our church, we did have a massive, the tree at the church was probably, I'd say, what, eight? Eight feet wide at the base? And probably, I don't know, 30, 40 feet high? And it came crashing down right in our parking lot? Uh, but didn't, you know, it was probably 40 to 50 feet from the church. So we had no damage to the church building. Uh, there was another log that came and it fell right across the path where the people drive in to go to the church. Right across the path, another tree fell down. Right in between the church and then a utility building over here. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> when I got over there late Monday afternoon to the church, those trees could have demolished that church. Could have demolished it very easily. 
and it would have been horrible. But I can thank the Lord this morning that as I'm here, there are folk back at Truth Triumphant, and uh, they're worshiping back there this morning. So, very thankful. Very, very thankful. So, folk, I, I would just encourage you, uh, memorize these verses in Psalms 139, at least 1 through 11. Uh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Um, well, like to look this morning, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, we looked last time in Daniel chapters 1 through 11 when I was here. Uh, we did it rather quickly, but, you know, we got an overview of those chapters. Uh, I'd like to start in Daniel chapter 12 actually with reading Daniel 11 verses 44 and 45 uh, to get right into it. Daniel 11:44 says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Now what are tidings? Can somebody tell me? What's a tiding? News? What was something else somebody said? Rumors. Warning, Jim. Okay. Rumors. Rumors. Okay, Sue. Rumors. Okay, so here is some message that comes out of the east, and then there's another message that comes out of the north. Now, Revelation 7, 1 to 3 says that there were four angels holding back the winds of strife. And John saw another angel. Do you know which direction he was coming from? The coming from the east. If you turn in your Bibles there, it's Revelation 7 and verse 2. Revelation 7 verse 2. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east. And what message or what news or what rumor does this angel come with from the east? What is it? Seal of God. The seal of the living God, Jim. And what is the seal of the living God? It's the Sabbath, the sign of God's creative and redeeming power. So one of the messages that angers this final king of the north is the message of the Sabbath. Now that puts you and me right here in Daniel 11, 44, doesn't it? Because we're here on the Sabbath, and that's a message that angers the final king of the north. Now, what's another message that comes out of the east? Well, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 27. Notice what the Bible says. For as the lightning cometh out of the, what direction? East. Comes out of the east and shineth even unto the west what comes from the east, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So from what direction does Jesus come? East. Comes from the east. So the message of the second coming comes out of the east. And it says in Daniel 11 that the final king of the north is angered because a group of people, in spite of the king of the north invading the glorious land, a group of people still are proclaiming the message of the seventh-day Sabbath. And they're still proclaiming the second coming of Christ. Now when you put those two messages together that come out of the east, does that identify a people? Ed, that identifies you and me, and you too, sweetie, doesn't. Now, what is your name? Anna. Anna. Thank you, Anna. That identifies all of us, doesn't it? And it also identifies our responsibility and our privilege in this world, and that is to share those messages, among others, with the inhabitants of the world. Now, the message out of the judge, uh, out of the north, that troubles the final king of the north, well, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, the Bible says that out of the north, God will utter his judgments. Verse 16, 
Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 13 to 16. Start with verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. And the Lord said to me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. So the Lord is emphasizing the north, the north, the north. And what comes out of the north? Verse 16 says, I will utter my judgments against them touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. So folk, the message out of the north is the message of judgment. Now can you think of anywhere in the Bible where we have messages of judgment? Where are they? Revelation 14, now we've got fear God and give glory to Him. Why? For the hour of His what? Judgment. His judgment is come. The final king of the north hates the first angel's message. Amen. Are there any other messages of judgment in Revelation 14? Think about it. Are there? <laughs> okay. It's the entire three angels' messages are messages of judgment. Because in the first angel's message, it's the hour of his judgment is come. Well, the second angel's message is also a message of judgment, isn't it? Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Is that a message of judgment? Yes. Absolutely it is. It's a message of judgment on apostate Protestant churches. And then Jim, as you said, the third angel's message. Is that a message of judgment? Amen. You bet it is. And that's a message of judgment on the papacy, on apostate Protestants, and on all those who honor the day of the sun. So folk, Daniel 11 verse 44 is talking about an end time group of people who are so committed that in spite of the king of the north invading the glorious land which is God's last day church there's a group of people who say we are still going to give these messages Amen. we're still going to proclaim Christ as creator and redeemer we're still going to talk about the fact that Jesus is coming again. And we're still going to warn the world from the, the messages out of the north. We're still going to give the messages in the first, second, and third angel's message. So folk, Daniel 11 verse 44 is talking about our time. Daniel saw our day over 2,500 years ago. Now verse 45, and he, the final king of the north, obviously I think it's just so clear who this final king of the north is. It's the papacy because the papal power hates these messages. Verse 45 says that the papacy, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, we'll go through this real quick, but what do you do in a tabernacle? You worship. So it says that the papacy would plant their style of worship in the glorious holy mountain. What is the papacy style of worship? What is it? Sun it's sun worship, Ed. That's right, it's sun worship. So it says there that the papacy would plant sun worship in the glorious holy mountain. Now, the only thing that's glorious in our world today is where God manifests His presence and He manifests it in a church that is in submission to Him. So folk, Daniel 11.45 is saying 
the papacy will plant Sunday worship in God's last day professed church. Now that's what the Bible says. In Seventh-day Adventism, before this is all over, you know, we get this idea that Seventh-day Adventism is somehow, it's just going to keep right on going to the Promised Land. And that includes the denomination and, and all of the organization. It's all going through. But folk, Daniel 11, 45, 45 doesn't say that. Daniel 11.45 says that Rome will plant Sunday worship in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And the only people that will survive that final attack by Rome on God's people, professed people, will be those who are living in submission to Christ and who love His truth more than anything else in the world. But everyone else, those that are celebrating, those that are uh, ordaining women, those who are in LGBT, those who believe in salvation and sin, those who don't want to hear Ellen White anymore, folk, they're going to wrap their arms around Sunday worship and become our most bitter enemies. As Ellen White says in Great Controversy 608, isn't that fascinating at the end of verse 45? Rome plants Sunday worship in Seventh-day Adventism. And then the verse finishes and says, Yet, when it looks like the papacy is going to win in this world, when it looks like Rome has all the churches by the jugular vein, and folk, let's face it, what's going to happen within a month and a half over in Europe? What's going to happen? 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And what are the Jesuits, Jim, going to use that occasion for? What are they going to use it for? A celebration of the Protestant churches coming back to Rome. That's exactly right, Jim. And I've been told that there will be representatives, not only from all the apostate Protestant churches, but also from the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. They will be coming, they will be coming and uniting and celebrating the fact, friends, that they are all united together in ecumenical harmony. The protest is over, Sue, just as Tony Palmer and Kenneth Copeland and Pope Francis said. But folk, we, and we've got to make a decision every single day. It may be over in their minds. It may be over in those churches. Is the protest over no. in our hearts? Will we ever let that, that protest die? And folk, a thousand times, a million times, no. We will protest to our dying day. I remember one time in Coos Bay, after a meeting that we had on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, three Roman Catholic women, I, I put my, I had a briefcase, I put my Bible in my briefcase and I stood up and they were standing right in front of me. And the one in the middle, Face was as red as a red a strawberry, a ripe strawberry, <laughs> with a chain around her neck and a cross. And she looked at me and she stuck her finger in my face. She said, don't you ever say that again. I said, say what again, ma'am? Don't you ever say that the Pope is the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And folk, I looked at her and I stared right into her eyes. And I said, ma'am, as long as blood flows through my veins, I will declare that truth. Amen. Folk, she and her friends, they flipped 
and they went down that far aisle as fast as they could go but folk they've never forgotten that message that day Amen. they've never forgotten it and uh, but folk I pray every day Lord keep me low to the ground that the truth of the three angels messages will never die in my heart yeah. never die let me die but not those messages because they're going to go through to the kingdom the Bible says that Rome will come to her end and none shall help him the final king of the north friend when she thinks she's won she's going down as Rome gathers next month and she thinks she has the world the Bible says she's going down she is going down praise the Lord friends you know I grew up all my young life I was into sports that's all we ate drank slept sports basketball football baseball and everything else and folk I never liked being on the losing team I remember I could tell you story after story but my older brother who's a professional broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs baseball team one day he and I were on the same team we were losing against two guys that were about 6'5 we were playing basketball these guys were 6'5 they could shoot the ball from the outside and or they could just basically dunk it in the basket my older brother he was so competitive he kicked he pushed me on the ground and he started kicking me and punching me now folk <laughs> I knew exactly what he was doing he was saying Bill we are losing and I don't like to lose <laughs> and so I'm gonna kick you and I'm going to beat you up until you get it through your head that we're not going to lose this game. <laughs> and you know what, folk? When he did that, we were probably down about 20 points. We were getting demolished. After he did that to me, one of those six foot five guys, he didn't score another point because I was in his face. Because, folk, in our family we didn't like to lose we didn't like to lose it's just that simple Jack you go out and you play a game you play to win now obviously that's devilish it is it's devilish plain and simple we were my brother and I my brother one game he poked a guy's eyes out and the guy had to leave the game for about a half the guy was about six foot ten he was just destroying my brother's team folk but in the Lord's cause the three angels messages they're gonna win Amen. they're gonna win and I want to be on the side of the winning team not in anger or in competitive vengeance but in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. let's take a look Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says at that time when the messages have gone to all the world Sunday has come in the Bible says and at that time shall Michael stand up when does Michael stand up somebody tell me close of probation for all the world probation closes Michael stands who is Michael Jesus. Jesus is Michael it says the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time what happens during that time of trouble somebody tell me what is it mercy is no more but what starts falling during that the seven last plagues in Revelation 16 okay 
And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that should be found written in the book. What book is that? The book of what? The book of life. That's right. And those people whose names are in the book of life, what experience do they have? Okay, they go through Jacob's time of trouble. Brent, that's right. Revelation 3, 5 says, To him that overcometh. To him that overcometh will I clothe in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So the people that are delivered there, it's not about church affiliation, it's not about profession, it's about surrender to Christ. To the point of saying, Lord, I'd rather die, I'd rather die than do something wrong. Now that's the experience these people will have. They'd rather die than do wrong. And folk, that's not an experience that we develop when a Sunday law is passed. No. It's an experience that we are training ourselves in each and every day, right now. Because right now we are preparing our hearts by the decisions we make. Right now, we're preparing to either embrace the seal of God and maintain the Sabbath or to embrace sun worship. So folk, it's now, it's now that the Lord wants our whole heart and our submission to His perfect will. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. What's this talking about? Special resurrection, isn't it? Just before Christ comes, many, not all that sleep in the dust of the earth, but many, some to everlasting life. Who are the ones that come up to everlasting life? Those who died in the faith of the third angel's message, the Sabbath. Those since 1844 who died in the faith of the third angel's message will rise to see Jesus come. Now, it also says, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Who are they? Those who killed Christ. Those who killed Christ. And the biggest persecutors. Most violent persecutors of God's people down through the ages. Great Controversy 637 says that very thing. Okay? So, Caiaphas will be there. Herod will be there. Pilate will be there and papists and other cruel people down through the ages that killed God's people. They'll come up in that special resurrection. They'll see who they were warring against through their life. And they that be wise. I want to be wise. I want to be wise. I don't want to be a dummy. You know, I've done some dumb things in my life. But I want to be wise. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Well, let's take a look at that for a minute. Who, see here's the statement in Great Controversy 637. Ellen White says, Graves are open. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him. Revelation 1.7 Those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in His glory and to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. So there's the statement, friends. And it's, it's the Bible says it, Daniel 12 says it, verse 2, Revelation 1, 7 says it, Matthew chapter 26 says it, verses 64, 65, talks of a special resurrection, and Great Controversy 637 confirms it. Right there. Now, 
A special blessing is pronounced upon those who turn people to righteousness. Well, what is righteousness in the Bible? Okay, right doing. But what, how does the Bible say it? Truth. Truth. Okay. Notice this. Jeremiah 23, 6. This is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So, who is righteousness? Jesus. Jesus is righteousness. Are we righteousness? No. We don't have any righteousness. As Isaiah 64, 6 says, For we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's why we need to turn to and depend upon the Lord our righteousness because he is righteous and he will give that righteousness to us to enable us to do what we can't do. Now, how else is righteousness described? Psalms 119, 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. So Christ is righteousness God's law is righteousness. And Daniel 12 says, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. We turn people to Christ who alone can give us power to do right. And we also turn people back to God's downtrodden law done so by the little horn of Daniel 7 and the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We turn people back to and we exalt all ten of God's commandments. Those are the wise, friend. Those are the wise that will shine as the stars in the firmament forever and ever. Now, Daniel 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, good, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, what book, what book is Daniel told would be shut up and sealed down to the time of the end? What book is that? Okay, chapter 8. Yeah, it, verses 14. Daniel 8, 14. Okay, I think that's part of it, Jim. What book? It, it doesn't say a chapter here. It says, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. What book in the Bible? Revelation. Okay, it's not Revelation. Revelation wasn't written yet. Because when Daniel was told this, this was back in the 6th century B.C. What book was sealed up, friends? The book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the entire book, especially as it pertained to prophecy, was to be sealed up to the time of the end. Okay? Now, in Great Controversy, page 356, Ellen White says that the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798. Okay? So the time of the end, and this becomes very important, folk, because there are folks like um, Marion Barry, um, Sue shared with me a, a, uh, a video by Doug Batchelor where they take Daniel 12 and they kick it down to the very close of time. And folk, Daniel chapter 12 is not about the very last moments of earth's history. It's not what... The focus of Daniel 12 repeatedly is the time of the end. And that's very important. 
because many Seventh-day Adventists, we had a guy come into our church three Sabbaths ago and he told my uh, helper, Paul Prano, he said, Paul, Daniel 12 is in the future. No, it's not in the future, friend. It's not in the future. The focus of Daniel 12 is 1798 and thereabouts. That's the focus of Daniel 12. So the time of the end, 1798. Now, when it says there, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. We've always interpreted that and said, well, that, that means that people are going to have dishwashers and microwaves and, and there'll be airplanes and, um, you know, we'll have speedboats. It's not what it's about at all, folks. Knowledge shall be increased, but it's not about things in the secular world. This is about Bible prophecy. Now notice what Great Controversy says. Great Controversy, page 360. She says this, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This phrase here means as it relates to the prophecies in Daniel, knowledge of them would increase. That's what that verse is talking about, folks. Why would it increase? Because prophecy has been fulfilled. The papacy has received their deadly wound in 1798. And now the book of Daniel is unsealed and the prophecies in Daniel are exploding around the world. That's what that verse is talking about. She goes on. Prophecy has been fulfilled. Are we never to know that period while he himself exhorteth us not only to read Daniel the prophet, but to understand it? And in that very Daniel where it is said that the words were shut up to the time of the end, which was the case in his time, and that many shall run to and fro, a Hebrew expression for observing and thinking upon the time and knowledge regarding that time shall be increased. Besides this, our Lord does not intend to say by this that the approach of the time shall not be known, but that the exact day and hour knoweth no man. Enough, he does say, shall be known by the signs of the times to induce us to prepare for his coming, as Noah prepared the ark. Now, folk, I, I noticed on your brochure that or the bulletin that you guys are studying the prophecy, Sabbath afternoons, awesome. Um, you know, if anybody, and I'll just throw this out, totally don't have to do it, but on our YouTube channel, Truth Triumphant YouTube, if you go to playlists, we've got the Daniel series from Daniel chapter 1 all the way through to Daniel chapter 12. Verse by verse study. If you want to study the prophecies of Daniel and understand them, it's all there. We've got one on Revelation and there's just a bunch of them. But folk, we need to understand prophecy or we'll be misled. Daniel chapter 12 is not in chronological sequence. People, I've heard them say it for years, they say, well, because Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2 is talking about the close of probation, the time of trouble, and the deliverance of God's people at the second coming, therefore, everything in Daniel 12 is right in that same time period. No, it's not. Daniel 12 is not in chronological order. It's not. Verses 1 and 2 looked at the close of probation, the time of trouble, the special resurrection. Verses 3 and 4 break this order with a blessing on those who turn people to Christ and His law, plus a mentioning of the sealing of Daniel's book until 1798. So, folk, Daniel 12 is not in chronological order. Daniel 
goes on, verses 5 and 6. I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now it's very clear that the man in linen here is Jesus. Because he's described the same way in Daniel chapter 10, described the same way in Revelation chapter 1. It's the same person. It's Christ who is asked, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And notice, folk, again that word, end. Well, we just saw the end, the time of the end, mentioned in verse 4. That was 1798. The end described in Daniel 12, verse 6, it's the same 1798. Daniel mentions the end several times toward the end of his book. Daniel 11 verse 40, At the time of the end shall the king of the north. Daniel 12 verse 4, Seal the book to the time of the end. The time of the end, 1798, when Daniel's book is unsealed. The question is in verse 6, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Again, the time of the end. Daniel 12 and verse 7. No, we'll go on. Verse 9, verse 8. O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And verse 13, But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So folk, the end that is being referenced here in Daniel 12, it's the time of the end. It's 1798 and the unsealing of the prophecies in the book of Daniel. It doesn't say it's the end of time. It says it's the time of the end. This concept is crucial if we're going to rightly understand the closing verses in chapter 12 of Daniel's book. Three times the phrase time of the end is specifically stated. This we already know is 1798. Five times reference is made to the end. Is this talking about the very close of time? Well, notice. Daniel 12, 13 again, But go thou thy way till the end be. Well, what end is it talking about? Well, thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. When did Daniel stand in his lot? He stood in his lot in 1798. That's when he stood in his lot. The focus of Daniel 12 is 1798 and the surrounding events and the time prophecies. So folk, when folk push these prophecies in Daniel 12, as Doug Batchelor has done, Mary and Barry and other people, those are not in the future. These are all in the past. They're all in the past. Daniel 12 and verse 7. I heard the man clothed in linen. There's Christ. Upon the waters of the river. He held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, what is that talking about right there? A time, times, and half a time. What's that talking about? 1260 years. Where did we see this same time period before? Where was it? Where was it, Gene? Revelation. Okay, it's in Revelation chapter 12. Where is it in the book of Daniel? Chapter 7, Ed, that's right. 
This time period of a time times and a half is mentioned in three different ways in the Bible. What are they? 42 months, time times and half a time, and what's the other one? 1260 years. And they all three represent the time. When did it start? 538 and goes down to 1798. And that was the time of papal supremacy in our world. 1260 years. Isn't that interesting that Jesus would mention right here in Daniel 12 and verse 7 when it's talking about the time of the end he would talk about the 1260 year time prophecy. A repeat of the same time period is here specified. This is the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Some believe this to be referring to literal time down at history's close. If this were so, then the obvious question would be, can't God make up his mind? Now think about that for a minute, folks. Daniel 7 verse 25 says that the little horn would rule for a time, times, and half a time. And we say that's 1260 years. And then people say, Oh, but in Daniel 12, now it's talking about literal time. Can't God make up his mind? In Daniel 7, it's prophetic time. But now five chapters later, it's literal time. You know what, if somebody had told me that when I was first studying the prophecies of Daniel, I would have stopped studying with them and said, you know what, I don't believe in a God that in five chapters can't decide whether it's prophetic time or literal time. Do you see the point? Some of you look concerned. <laughs> you don't see the point. God does not change. He doesn't change, Lisa. That's the point. If in Daniel 7 the time is prophetic time, in Daniel 12 it's also prophetic time. Do you understand me? God doesn't change. He doesn't change. So if you hear somebody saying, well, the time in Daniel 12 is literal. No, it's not. No, it's not. Some would interpret Daniel 12 as literal. Some would interpret these prophecies as coming down near closing events in Christ's coming. What does Ellen White say? She says, there were many proclaiming a new time after 1844. But I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. Now, could we get any more clearer than that? There would be no more messages on time to proclaim to the people. Oft-repeated messages of definite time was exactly what who wanted? The devil. The enemy wanted. So it's the devil who keeps bringing up time in the future. It's the devil that's doing that. It served his purpose well to unsettle the faith in the first proclamation of time, which was of heavenly origin. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of the Lord's coming. That's what I like about Ellen White. She has no trouble with human communication. It's very clear. And if you hear somebody come along and say, oh no, there's time periods now. Well, now they've just sidestepped and kicked the spirit of prophecy in the teeth. And we better not go along with them. Daniel 12 is repeating what we saw in chapter 7, verse 25. 
Prophetic time, a day equals a year. A literal time is used in the Bible. It's obvious though by its context and by reason. In Daniel chapter 1, when Daniel asked for 10 days to be proved whether his diet was the best, I mean, are we going to say, well, that was 10 years? <laughs> of course not. How ridiculous. How ridiculous. Creation. Or creation is another one, Lisa, of course. So context makes it very clear. Very clear. Daniel 1 isn't dealing in symbols, but Daniel 12 is. Daniel 9.2, 9, referring to the Babylonian captivity. That was literal. The Jews were in Babylon for 70 years. It wasn't 490 years or, you know, 5,000. It was four, or it was 70 literal years. Let me go on down real quick to these last two prophecies, time periods, and then we'll close. Daniel 12 and verse 11 says that from the time that the daily... Now the word sacrifice was not in the Textus Receptus. It shouldn't have been there. It should just say daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So folk, the papal power was the abomination that made desolate God's law. And it says that an event would occur sometime before the papacy's rise in 538 that would make it possible for them to rise. This controversial verse is really quite simple. Some event would trigger the setting up of the papacy in 538. The daily or the committing of people to the worship of Christ would be supplanted by the worship of the one who sets up the abomination that makes desolate. Christ warned of this abomination in Matthew 24. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. The pagan Romans set up this abomination in 70 AD when they took over Jerusalem. They set up their standard in the holy places which extended some distance outside the city. Their standard had a sundial on the top. Pagan Rome worshipped the sun. The papacy continued this tradition by worshipping the sun as well in their exaltation of Sunday worship. Here was a papal, or not a papal, but a Roman standard. This was it right here. And here's their sundial right in the heart of it. There's your sundial right there. Well, what event, what event triggered the fact that Rome would rule the world through the Dark Ages? What event made it possible for the papacy to become firmly entrenched in 538. Uriah Smith in his book Daniel and Revelation which has a lot of very good material page 325 he says that in 508 AD there was a Frankish king by the name of Clovis converted to Catholicism and Clovis by 508 won a very decisive battle that knocked out the Germanic tribes in Europe. And Clovis's victory by 508 AD, the eminence which Clovis had attained in the year 508 and the significance of his victories to the future of Europe and the church were so great that historians cannot forbear commenting on them. So Clovis won a great victory in 508, paved the way for the rise of the papacy in 538. And we will close with a chart. 
Clovis, decisive victory makes for sure that the papacy would rise. The papacy rises in 538. Now the 1290 year prophecy and the 1335 both began in 508. The 1290 ended in 1798. The 1335 ended in 1843. And the time times and half a time ended in 1798. Blessed are those who stand with the people of God and follow God's prophetic hand down to 1843. Let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love to us and thank you for the prophetic hand, your prophetic timetable. Father, I pray that we would study to understand these things and to witness to your um, great hand in history. In Jesus' name.